Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Reformers broadcast. I am so excited to be with you today. Just as you're jumping on, we see people are jumping on already. They're excited. You're excited about what we've got going on today. And uh, so if you're jumping on, tell us where you're watching from. Just type in the comment section the, the city or the place. I see Tiffany is on already. Perez Sandovo. Hello. Tell us where you're watching from. And uh, don't forget to click and share the broadcast because it's this easy. Somebody could hear something they wouldn't have heard or seen simply because you clicked share. So we want to encourage you to share the broadcast. Tiffany's watching from Odessa, Texas. We welcome all our United States of America friends and followers that are on here. We just we love you from Canada, although I'm in the Philippines. And speaking of which, we've got a rooster. We've got a whole bunch of roosters that have congregated because they're they're excited about who we have on the broadcast today. And that's a little bit of humor for you. You might hear some some cockadoodle-doo in the background. We apologize for that. I'm broadcasting live from the Philippines, and it's 8:30 in the morning here. So 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 excited to have you guys as you're joining just share the broadcast and you know what this week we've got another incredible history makers experience training happening uh starting tomorrow this is uh online of course but hosted through a ministry in uh kentucky in lexington kentucky usa so the history makers experience is happening in the u.s we've got another one in two weeks time in france and you know what? History makers experience is just something special. It's something unusual that God is using. He has been for a number of years. And we actually have a graduate who's on with us today. She is just a history maker in her own right. Uh, you know, just even though she passed through our academy, she's just somebody that God is just consistently using and growing and expanding her platform and god gives platforms based on sonship or or daughterhood if you're a female daughterhood and sonship those who prove themselves as mature in christ god trusts them with greater platform and aisha francis is just is just one of those so as we're giving you another few moments to jump on just make sure you click share let us know where you're watching from we are so excited about who we have on today. Yeah, Tiffany says, excited, fire, 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 fire. <laughs> That's so awesome. So welcome to the Reformers broadcast. I'm trying to think if there, there was another announcement I wanted to make. Uh, I think those of you that joined us on the Miracle Monday broadcast, you saw that I've kind of taken the decision to speak more as it relates to the genuine apostolic. That was a word I was avoiding for a long time, simply because of, uh, you know, the, the answer is very simple, the abuse of it. Uh, you know, the, we were constantly in conversations about the apostolic. It was something that seemed just theory, just a dream of some kind. And you saw it in other countries, but maybe didn't recognize it in our, in our, on our own soil. But then as well, it was something that you, you know, there was often people calling themselves apostles and apostolic ministry saying, we are apostolic, but you didn't see the fruit, which is the building up of people, the building up of society. The genuine apostolic was never meant to be some kind of governmental thing that controls churches, controls people. The Bible says, Paul said, we have been given this grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of the Gentiles unto Christ, not the obedience of your church <laughs> necessarily. And so we are all about equipping, sending people into their destiny, calling, and purpose. And I'm just so excited about who we have. On this broadcast today, Aisha Francis is someone who truly exemplifies what it is to be awakened, equipped, and sent. And uh, you've heard me talk about her all over the world. <laughs> and you've probably seen her testimony, the memes. She's one of many people who have had just extraordinary breakthroughs through our academy. But again, in her own right, you know, with or without our training, you know, she, is, she was just on a, a track for greatness. And we like to think that maybe we were catalysts in some way. 
uh, to that. So let me tell you a, a bit about Aisha before I bring her out here today. Uh, called upon internationally as a thought leader and prolific speaker, Aisha Francis has the gift of meshing life narratives, experiences, and purpose seamlessly with business strategy and structure. She is a seasoned professional with extensive experience across the corporate, charitable, and chosen, aka entrepreneurial, sectors. Years ago, Aisha walked away from her corporate aspirations, intent on unlocking the truest version of herself and becoming her own boss. How do you like this bio? This is why I'm reading it. It's, it's so good. <laughs> Today, Aisha is an author and the founder and executive director of the charity Project Restore Phoebe families impacted by incarceration. She also has started her namesake business strategy and consulting agency, Aisha K. Francis, to help seasoned professionals and emerging entrepreneurs through their own journey of successfully converging what they do as a purposeful extension of who they are. That is loaded. You know what? We, we just, I want to jump right into this because some of these statements are really loaded. But let me give you just a few other aspects of her biography. Through Project Restore Phoebe, Aisha delivers pioneering family-centered community services, promotes sector ingenuity and best practices, and unapologetically advances grassroots leadership. Scholarship and policy review for families, collaterally affected by incarceration. She broadens her commitment to advocacy community engagement and leadership through mentorship in her directorship roles on the boards uh, of, on the board of the Ajax Public Library, the CEE Center for Young Black Professionals, Eva's Initiatives for Homeless Youth, and other committees she sits on. Aisha is the recipient of several awards, including the 2017 Social Innovation Challenge People's Choice Award, the 2019 Queen's Rising Together Inspirational Woman Award, and is recognized as one of 2020's 100 Accomplished Black Canadian Women. <laughs> I just love reading that bio. I mean, that just shows us what we're capable of. Eh? So, so let's bring Aisha out. Aisha Francis, we are so excited to have you on the Reformers broadcast. Welcome. How are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you, Pastor Derek? Man, I'm good after reading that bio. I just feel like I could accomplish anything. <laughs> With God, all things are possible. <laughs> yeah, that, that is that is the truth, and yeah, and and strong work ethic as well. I mean, absolutely managing all those things. Was your life always like that? I I I think I know the answer to that. But were you always? an achiever at that level or was there a point where something shifted? Well, um, I think I always worked hard. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. I think that life is always busy, but certainly uh, I wasn't achieving at that level. I feel wow. like there were things within me that, um, I, I feel like you always think as a believer that your things are possible, right? But I didn't know how to get to those possibilities. Um, I think I lacked some confidence in those possibilities. I think I lacked a knowing that, you know, those things were actually attainable and or that I had a responsibility to go after the things wow. that I thought God was showing me to do. And the the catalyst really for the work that I'm doing, walking away from corporate, that decision was specifically made after I took History Makers training. Because wow. I think, I don't know if you know this, Pastor Derek, or not, but at the time when I took History Makers training and I was in my corporate job, I was actually being primed for promotion. I had a sponsor ah. who had been working with um, a few different people within my organization. And we were like literally um, about to move me into a promotion. Um, and I had been working on this promotion probably for about nine months or so, like doing all wow. of the and you know, showing that I deserve the promotion, getting my sponsor on board, getting my manager on board, all of the work that goes into really setting you on that platform. And then I take History Makers training and literally <laughs> uh, design, right? At History Makers training, design the, the blueprint for Project Restore Phoebe, which is the homework. It came out of the homework, but it wasn't what I thought the homework was gonna be. And God downloaded oh. this. 
And then literally going home and God saying, leave that job. Um, excuse me, I've been here for seven years. <laughs> I'm finally getting into the role that I want to be in and being promoted and I'm gonna walk away. But absolutely, because History Makers put me on a trajectory that opened up so many opportunities for me to do some of the things that you read about in my bio. Wow, so that really was a catalyst for you. And absolutely. you know, most people, when they think of attending a Christian event, they're thinking conference, they're thinking mm -hmm. lay hands on me, you know, they're thinking something supernatural has to happen or it has to look a certain way. You know, we, we won't talk all about history makers here on this interview, but what was it about the training that was unique that really helped you to begin to think differently and create something like this? Well, yeah, um, I think prior to that, I was definitely the believer in church that would go to the altar often, mm. <laughs> um, asking God for my breakthrough, you know, yeah. praying through the difficulties in life and really wanting God to show up. And, you know, you're doing some stuff like you're, you're tithing and you're being obedient, but you're not really doing um, the kind of work, right? Because that was reserved for the pastors are supposed to do stuff like that. Or, you know, there are certain people that we sort of, identified as the ones who carry the gospel. Mm. So going to History Makers said, the onus is on you to bring the gospel into the world. And it is wow. not on the pastors or the ones in the church. It is, you know, what has God called you to do out here? And what has he given you? What has he, for my example, what has he brought you through? So all of that wow. breakthrough that I was praying for it was walking through my process of looking at my life, looking at what our family had been through, designing a program um, for that, that really was the catalyst for change. For and that would, be, that would be Project Restore Phoebe. And I remember when you told me the vision about that, and it was something so unique. It was something you had personally been touched with. I mean, well, of all the things we could talk about, we've got to just jump right into that. What is Project Restore Phoebe? How did it come about? And how were you touched by that personally? Yeah. So Project Restore Phoebe, F-I-B-I, which stands for Families Impacted by Incarceration, is an organization that is specifically for families who have a loved one that has gone to prison, who has been impacted by the criminal justice system. And so we are providing supports for those families as they navigate mm -hmm the criminal justice system because they have someone who's in there. That came about because my of our own experience. My family was a family impacted by the incarceration of my husband. And so we journeyed for many years through shame and isolation and financial obstacles, um, you know, trauma, mm. breakdown of our family because of it, all of these pieces. And I never thought going through, so this is why I would pray and I was asking for breakthrough and I was asking for the restoration of my family. I never actually thought that that would be the thing that God would use me for wow. to touch other people because, wow. because it was so embarrassing, because it was so shameful, because it was such a difficult part in our lives. It really was the wilderness um, in many times. And so to see God then take that. And I remember having a conversation with you, Pastor Derek, about some of the challenges around some of the things that were happening in my own family, even when I started Phoebe. And you said, you know, as you begin to share with others, the word comes alive that we overcome by the blood of the lamb and the power of our testimony. And right. so in going out there and being able to share with other families what we've been through, how we triumphed over the triumph over that um, and share with them some, you know, little practical, I wouldn't say little, practical things that families can do. You know, how can we guide our children so that they don't end up walking down that path to incarceration? That's the work that we do through Project Restore PD. We provide everything from counseling to um, backpacks every year for children that are impacted by incarceration, so cool. parental incarceration. So we've given about 600 backpacks over the last 
five years um, out to children. We do a Christmas drive every year where we literally buy presents for every member of the family that has been wow. by incarceration. Uh, we are doing research and, you know, um, looking at policy and creating policy recommendations, supporting other organizations in building their capacity to serve families that are impacted by incarceration. So that's the work that we do. And it's to change the stigma and the narrative for these families, but ultimately it is to disrupt the cycle of incarceration yeah. that destroys families. Now, this is amazing, Aisha. And you know, when, when you describe like you being touched with that, you could almost feel just even on this broadcast, just a break moment, a breakthrough moment in people's minds that the worst thing they've been through, the lowest place they've been, can actually become their platform to reach people in the same situation. I mean, that was just so, so powerful to hear that. And have you seen that people have been inspired by your story? Oh my goodness, yes. So I can share stories upon stories upon stories, but uh, a couple of significant ones. When I was leaving my corporate job, uh, I had my managers and different people saying, you know, can we get you to stay? Like, what? where are you going? Or they thought I was going to my competitor or different things were happening. And so finally, I said to one of them, here's the real reason why I'm leaving. And I was a little bit afraid to say it to anybody because again, I'd been in this company for so many years. Nobody really knew our story. We had I had kept that hidden. And I will tell you that upon me explaining to people why I was leaving there, and what I was starting, I was finding, founding this organization to start it. I had four colleagues reach out to me and take mm -hmm. me to lunch or meet me in the, um, you know, the coffee area. And each one of them had their own personal story. Wow. Impacted my sister, wow. my nephew, my this, my that. As I went out to speak and I was being invited different places to speak, I would show up in a room and I think people didn't expect this to be my story because I would talk <laughs> to the organization and, you know, you get the usual stuff like you're well-dressed, you look, you know, um, and then, you know, you kind of take them on this journey and then you say, the reason why is this? And people will be like, but even in those sessions, I would have businessmen coming up to me and crying about wow. their daughters that had been incarcerated and they never had an outlet to talk about this because you can't share it. it you're, it's so isolating and it's so stigmatizing. And so, you know, it became this thing that was a freedom mm. for other people to say, oh, this is my story too. And now I can talk about it. And now I have a safe space to really discuss how this affected me as a parent, me as a child, me as a spouse, um, me as a mother, you know, whatever that looked like for these people. And we created not only the atmosphere to have these conversations, not only the atmosphere for people to finally exhale and be like, and let the burden off their backs, but then to provide them with resources and help and, wow. you know, um, support to walk through all of the things that a family that is going through the situation needs to walk through. Wow. Now, you know what, typically in church culture, let's say, there's kind of this, this idea that the gospel is, is rooted in just evangelism or, you know, bringing people to church. If we can get them to come to church and change their life, that that's the gospel. But then you have, of course, this concept that I'm always talking about, organized righteousness, where yeah. we actually organize the kingdom out in society in the form of charities, projects, programs. Mm -hmm. um, how did you make that shift? Because, you know, you came up in church culture. You right. were immersed in that, but you're, you're a kingdom woman. But you would see what you're doing as not just, and I'm going to word it just the way it needs to be worded. You're not just doing mercy ministry or uh, uh, just, you know, an NGO, something good for society. This is ministry for you, I bet. And it, yeah. and it should be. This, this should be what the new face of ministry looks like when we talk about societal transformation. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about that mindset shift for you. So, um, so like, do you see it as ministry, you know? Oh, it absolutely is ministry. 
It absolutely wow. is ministry. And wow. I can even give examples of going to an event and speaking, right? And just, you know, I'm not quoting scriptures. I'm not, you know, yeah. referring to, you know, um, I can't think of one of the, you know, I'm not re re uh, no. referring to John 10, 10, like, you know, <laughs> life and life more abundantly. The, the enemy can <laughs> still steal and destroy, but Jesus has come, you know, <laughs> even though, even though, that is definitely interwoven into the work that we do. I, I recognize that I understand that. And I recognize that me showing up in the lives of people. So I remember one time I was giving a presentation and a young man, um, and, and not of Christian faith, I don't believe, uh, asking the question, like, you know, as I kind of talked about my family story, and he was like, what was the, like, what was the thing behind that? And being able to, in that moment, thinking, hmm, how do I respond? Do I respond in like a really like, you know, societal way, politically correct way, or do I tell the truth? And even in that moment, I had an opportunity to speak about God and to speak about my faith and to speak about how that was an wow. integral part of what I do. Another example, we as an organization... I'm a Christian woman, so obviously a lot of the principles that I base my programming in and stuff will come from my faith, will come from biblical foundations. That is just inherent to who I am and inherent to how our organization is run. Um, however, we, again, don't quote scriptures and we don't class them all over the place. Yeah, We had a forum that I organized in November, and it was a forum that was looking at the impact of incarceration, gun violence, and trauma on families mm -hmm. and black families in particular, but families generally. And I remember organizing this with academia. Um, I had, you know, different organizations around the table, uh, government officials, all these people are coming to this conference. We had close to 200 people attend the conference. And wow. as we were the planning stages, I remember very initially we were, you know, I was thinking of like, who needs to be at the table as part of the steering committee? And one of the professors that I worked with said, um, excuse me, where's the faith community? Where's your church? Your church needs to be at this table because Aisha, you know, as much as I know you, I know that the church and you being connected to God and being rooted in your faith was an integral part of how your family was able wow. to so imagine that just showing up as I am. Yeah. That not me, but other people would recognize the need for God to be in the midst of the conversations that we're having. So we have this forum and the forum is a bunch of people presenting presenting, people with lived experiences, talking about everything. And the second half of the conference is us talking about policy and coming up with policy recommendations and writing a report that will go out to stakeholders. And so, you know, it's, it's so incredible as you ask the question of, is this ministry? It absolutely is ministry. One of the things that I personally believe is that we have a lot of stuff that's happening out in the world to address the social, economic, and societal issues that we have. But as I have gone and sat at tables, I always recognize that they are missing the most important piece, which is God. And wow. so I show up in a room and wow. people are like, how did you come up with that framework? I had a professor that I worked with very early on and I had come up with the framework and the model for Phoebe. And she was like, you wrote this? Like, how did you come up with this? And literally sitting with God and him showing me how we're going to do this. And so it absolutely is ministry in every way, but we can't actually create transformation in society if we remove God. And so I truly believe that a lot of organizations are out there doing great work, you mm -hmm. know, doing great work, yeah. but not, we're not seeing the transformation and the impact in our cities in the way that it needs to happen because they're doing all of the mental health pieces, you know, physically caring for people, doing all these, but they have removed the spiritual component and tr true transformation in people's lives and healing, especially from stuff like trauma and yeah. broken families cannot happen fully without it being ministry Christ-centered and focused. Man, this is so powerful. Everybody that's watching, you've got to share this broadcast. If you're just coming on again, feel free to give your comments, share where you're watching from. 
it's already just so, so powerful. This is the meat and potatoes right here. And I'm seeing, you know, Jude, Jude just posted something and we'll just bring it back up here. Aisha Francis, I think I have to bring this concept to our community here in Quebec. Will you train people? Uh, is there a demand for you to create a model where you train others to do this? Have you done that yet? You know, is this possible? Yes, so absolutely. I have been asked to do, so it started in the GTA, right? So I was asked, I was kind of serving um, GTA, so Durham and Toronto area. I was asked to come out to Hamilton to do this work. I've had a lady ask me to come out to BC to do this work. I've had um, the East Coast, Nova Scotia. I was I spoke at a, a conference at Durham College and she was there and said, how can we make this happen? Because she had her own situation happening there. So absolutely. Um, wow. The vision for, Pro for Project Restore Phoebe has always been to create chapters that span the nation and then internationally as well. Um, and so that is absolutely something that we can and will do. Um, Excellent. Yeah, it's a federal issue. It's a global issue, incarceration. So absolutely. Yeah, well, you know, this, this is needed all over the world. But as you begin in Canada, you know, things have a way of just have a way of just spreading. So this is so powerful. That's what we've got to do. We've got to see other people take this on. I mean, this is just this is just huge. Tell us a little bit more about how does Project Restore Phoebe work? If somebody's husband or wife is incarcerated, what are some of the things you're doing? And also, if you could tap into the principles behind it. I, I think I remember you're not necessarily preaching Jesus throughout it. Uh, how does it work? Why is it effective? Okay. So one of the first things that we do when a family comes into us, we do, we have an intake process. Sometimes it's very formal and sometimes it's a little less formal, right? So a family will reach out and we kind of have a conversation. I will often go and meet families. Obviously with COVID, we've had to change that a little bit, but you usually go and you meet a family and you hear about the situation. And so it begins there where I take the time to build a relationship with the person that has reached out to me and sit and hear their story. And so that's where it begins. Um, and so out of that, uh, we then, I will then go back and think about what does this family need? So I've, I heard them speak about their own mental health issues. I heard them speak about how do I have this conversation with my child? I've heard them speak about oh, I have to show up in court and I don't really understand some of the language that they're using in the court or what my responsibility is. Um, and so I, I've had a conversations with um, persons that talk about, you know, our home was raided and our door was broken down. And so you, you kind of, in the conversation, you get to learn what their situation is, what the sense of their family uh, structure and dynamics, what those are, and then, what their needs are really. And so out of that, I create a family care plan for the family. And so there are some, there are some needs that we as an organization can address. And there's others that I will refer them to partner organizations that we have. And so the things that I do internally, so that would look like, again, we can do um, counseling and walking them through everything from conflict resolution, communication, how to set some goals for their family, working with them while their loved one is away, very critically working with the family when their loved one is coming home, especially if they've been away for an extended period of time, because you have to work through, I've been gone for a long time, I'm coming into a family that doesn't look like the family I left. Wow. And we've got to talk about a husband coming in and the wife has been a single parent for a long time, parenting roles, spousal commitments, how wow. do I become a father and helping them to walk through those hard conversations um, and the shifting dynamics that can happen when a old new person is coming into a change <laughs> dynamic, right? Um, wow. Helping them with conflict resolution. One of the biggest things um, that is connected to that process is the family becomes the hub for this person coming in. And so they become the financial security they become the housing security. They become the mental health and addiction um, supports for this person if they have those. And so we are equipping these families with the resources that they need to help them to navigate all of the possible scenarios that can arise if someone comes back into a family. So that's part of, 
um, what we're doing. And then there's very practical things, like I said, so like the back to school event, you know, uh, education is one of the key ways that we can keep, you know, the trajectory of the children that are impacted by incarceration from following that trajectory. So we put an emphasis on that. And so when I think about the families, um, we provide backpacks with all of the school supplies that the children would need. Plus, we have done, my daughter's primarily, but I've engaged the community around this as well. Every backpack gets a note in it. We call it notes of inspiration. So people in the community, because my daughter's one time said to me, I don't think we should be duplicating these letters because you don't want kids coming up and going, oh, we all got the same thing. That's not, you know, so we ask people to submit their favorite quotes, their favorite scriptures, write a letter that you would write to your younger self. And every backpack has an individually written note in it. And so, again, it's to speak into this child's life. It is to say that, you know what, to the parent, we say, you've got a limited budget back to school is so important. Every kid going back to school is so special. For the parent, we're going to take the, the pressure off of you having to spend $50 to $100 on school supplies. We are going to provide those so you can buy the shoes or the clothes or the groceries, whatever you need. We're going to provide this for your children. For the kids, I've had situations where teenagers have dropped out of school, came to the event as bystanders or to help volunteer and decided to go back to school because of the environment we created with our back to school event. Young boys who were profiled by police the night before and were so discouraged came to the event and were walking around with their back, teenage boys. Wow. Backpacks, like, look at my backpack, look at my, you know, um, and just this atmosphere we've been able to create for families. So. That is the type of work that we're doing. And then when I talk about the research and stuff, that is a very, very important piece as well because we can't change policy in this country. We can't um, get resources reallocated to the things that matter without evidence. And so all of the research then backs up the work that we're doing, why we're doing it, why um, decision makers need and stakeholders need to respond differently to what we're wow. doing and wow. to this particular situation. And so, yeah, I hope I answered that question. I, I can yeah, you, you, <laughs> No, 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 you, you definitely did. I mean, because people want to know what what is Project Restore? How does that work? Because there's people that often say, you know what, God, use me. Somehow use what I've been through to reach this sector of society. But Aisha, they have no idea where to begin and yeah. what what that even looks like. Now, the concept of, you know, when people think of creating a program, sometimes we lean to the side of, I need to put Jesus somewhere in here. I need to preach somewhere in here. And I remember when you sat in my office and you showed me, you actually showed me the biblical kingdom principles mm -hmm. that were the undercurrent of the project. So they were there. The kingdom of God was there in the form yeah. of, the principles, biblical values, heaven's values. And, you know, I'm always teaching that that's really what it looks like to bring the kingdom of God to earth. Yes. When you organize it this way, the kingdom can visit someone's home based on principles that are implemented. Can you just touch on that? Because there's people out there that if they knew they could do it that way, they would create all kinds of projects and ministries and charitable organizations, and they would feel like they're doing the gospel. Just set some people free. <laughs> okay, so listen, Jesus doesn't go anywhere. He is always with us. He is with us through and through. I hope this doesn't sound terrible, but I'm sure it won't. <laughs> Jesus, you know, walk with Jesus in your ministry, in your prayer closet, you know, do your intercession, do all of that. It doesn't have to be in every line of what you're doing. It really does not have to be in every line of what you're doing. Great. I've worked with so many families. I've worked with um, a bunch of Somali families, mm. some families who have gone into their homes just to do my work. I haven't spoken a word about Jesus, but I came in and I spoke to their son, the son that they couldn't get through to. I sat with the son and started to, re to mend the relationship between mother and son 
and help him to heal through a lot of the tragedies he had gone through in his life. And then the mom saying to me before I leave, can you please pray? So Jesus. I didn't walk in with any agenda to do that, but then the door opened. But that is like a one-off. That doesn't generally happen. What generally happens is I'm going in and I have done, um, so very practically, Pastor Derek, when I created Project Restore Phoebe, of course I prayed. Of course I asked God for direction. But a lot of the a lot of the work that I did was like research. It was pulling up articles. It was going online and saying, how many families in Canada are impacted by incarceration? What's happening in the US around incarceration? What are some of the things that are being done currently to support families? And I was literally Googling and reading um, books. I got a slew of books that weren't biblical based books. They were just like going into chapters, stuff talking about, you know, racism and social inequities and the social determinants of health and really starting to understand the language that is currently being used in the sector and understanding who are the people in that sector doing work and what is the work that's being done. And I literally used all of that as a basis for the work that I do, how I would roll out Project Restore Phoebe. Like I said, we had a forum in November and we've written a report and the report is a report. It's a report that will go up to stakeholders that talks about, here's what we talked about at the forum. Here's the things that we've identified that are specific to these families. And here are our recommendations as to how as a government and how as decision makers, you need to address this. And so we have to always pray, always seek God for guidance. But in the work that you're doing, practically, there are things that you just need to, you have to research this, you have to write it this way. You have to roll it out this way. You know, you have to show up at the program and deliver to the women in who are incarcerated a program that is going to talk about how am I going to rebuild the communication between myself and my children because I'm incarcerated and they're, they're out there wondering where their mother is. Wow. Right? And so... Um, you, you can't rebuild that communication between a mother who's incarcerated and her child who's on the outside by saying, let's pray. Wow. You have to give them keys and you have to give them tips and tools and you have to walk them through even their own process of why do I behave the way that I do? Why am I always incarcerated? What have I done? And walk them through their process of, you know, going through you know, a sort of introspective place of, and this is part of the program that I deliver, but, you know, who is your family? What are these relationships look like? Literally on a, on a worksheet going, who are the people that you put on your family tree? Put their names on this page and rate your relationship with them. What does it look like right now? Be honest. What do you want it to look like? And then working through how are we going to change the, it's a three, but I'd like it to be a nine. How are we going to close that gap with practical tips? So, so practical. And this is what we've always been talking about, Aisha. You remember the concept of dual rulership, of being yes. excellent in the things of the spirit. Yes. But God's glory is also found in being excellent in the practical earthly management, yes. management of the spheres of society he has called us to manage. And I think yes. we've gotten so caught up in, Pray, pray, pray. Try to get God to come down and do something he's told us to go and do. He's mm -hmm. told us to go and disciple people groups. He's yeah. called us to go out and, and bring the kingdom of God, bring solutions to society. And I'm just hearing that all over what you're saying. Yeah. I love what you said. It's nothing against prayer, but yeah. you tapped into a higher dimension here. You said in that situation, you can't just say to the person, okay, let's pray about it, as good as prayer is. Yes. But there was a wisdom that was needed. That's what I'm hearing here is there's a wisdom. And it makes me think of the Josephs and the Daniels and people that God used in governmental, administrative situations that had a wisdom from God. I mean, this is so powerful. We've got people even on the broadcast right now saying, wow, so powerful. Guys, share this broadcast because we're right into the meat of this thing here yeah. where you're able to actually infuse, you know, kingdom principles, wisdoms into society to transform people's lives. That's what we're hearing here. And 
you know what? I'm not, I'm not going to get into a preach here, but I've just got to say, as you look throughout scripture, you see the things that are closest to God's heart are binding up the brokenhearted, taking care of the fatherless, meeting the needs of people everywhere from, from God saying, you know what, is this the acceptable fast I choose? Actually, the spiritual that I choose for you to do is taking care of the needs of the poor, the broken, all of this. And and just on and on, scripture after scripture, you see that this is clearly the thing closest to God's heart. And it says that you're in Psalm 82, your glory will come forth. Your righteousness will come forth, that this is actually glory. This is the glory of God as it manifests in the New Testament on earth. I'm I'm so, so blown away by this. So what kind of attention has this attracted? And, and I love that you're so overtly about God, though, in the same way. You're saying people are saying, hey, where's the faith? Where's the faith-based people? And where this is anchored in your faith, Aisha. Secular aspects of society are whipping open the doors to you. Why and what kind of things have happened? I know you've won a few awards. Just yeah. don't be shy. Just tell, tell us what, you, <laughs> what kind of attention has this attracted? How have you oh, become an influencer? <laughs> my goodness. It, it is incredible because um, I truly am a very private person, right? <laughs> why, as much as I show up and, you know, there's this stuff that happens and, and I'm, I'm deeply introverted and I'm very private. Um, but the door that it has opened, uh, oh, wow. Um, I, have been, I have been invited to speak all over. Mm -hmm. um, I've been out to the East Coast to a university out there where I was the keynote speaker, all expenses paid, flight, everything. They treated me beautifully. Um, and, you know, I had a two hour presentation that was just I was the only person. Right. Um, wow. So doors like that have opened. Like I, I've got, I went to last 2000, 2019, summer of last year. I spoke at, um, in, out in England and had a workshop at a, a international conference that was around um, the impact of incarceration on children. And so yeah. that type of stuff has happened. I have gotten calls in the last few weeks that I've been like, whoa, um, government and attorney generals uh, calling me. I wow. recently wrote an article in the Globe and Mail. I, was I saw that. I saw that. Let me just celebrate that for a moment. When I saw that, I thought, look at what has happened to Aisha. Because I knew you years ago. And to see the change, but not just the change. We often limit you know, what God does to a moment in time, a breakthrough moment. But you've had literally a progression where we're watching the tiny seed become the great tree. And then you're writing for the, you know, this article in the Globe and Mail. What was that about, the article? Tell us a little bit about the article that. Article was um, it was really looking at, well, I can't even remember what it was called <laughs> at this point. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I know what it's about, like. you know, the, the incarceration on families and the things that people need to consider and really uh, creating a appropriate and, and uh, correct narrative of what these families are and really just informing people, educating people. But I think the significance about it, which was, you know, I had a few of my colleagues reach out to me and go, you wrote for the Globe and Mail because those who may not be in Canada, um, there's a few papers here. I won't name them, but the Globe and Mail is really like the, the top, one of the top uh, newspapers right and so if you get an article in the Globe and Mail it's it's considered as a real accomplishment um so that happened yes you you spoke to some of the awards that I've received uh and again you know just who knew right um not sure why but well I know why but you know like but you're just doing the work. I, I've never done the work for that. Um, we, we have another thing that's happening right now, and I don't know that I can speak to it, but um, you know, there's there's a few other opportunities that are coming in the pipeline. So stay tuned. Those are happening in the background and stuff is building. But um, yeah, I, uh, this I, is, I know this I'm is missing a lot of stuff because I it's important and I have friends and I have my board of directors because Pastor Derek, as you know, because you're in ministry as well, this work is not always very sexy. 
right? Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's the right word, but it, it can be very challenging. It's not always feel good. Like you feel good that you're doing it, but there are moments of discouragement. It can be hard work um, in the justice sector. The work that I've done, I've really had to break some very hard ground. And there's moments where you think, oh, we finally got a breakthrough. And then you go into another meeting and you're like, oh man, are we starting from like ground zero again? Like I wow. thought we already had these conversations and I thought we had already kind of passed this phase. And so, you know, the the awards and the doors that open and these moments of like, you know, recognition or the opportunity to write articles and do some of the work that I do or sit at some of the tables that I sit at, um, my board and friends often remind me of these things because it 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 reminds me that the work is happening. It reminds me, it, it encourages me. You know, sometimes I, I think it was early this morning or yesterday morning, I literally laid in the bed and it was kind of gray here. And I was just like, you just want to sleep all day. Like, I don't want to get up and deal with a bunch of stuff. And I literally had to encourage myself in the Lord. I literally had to be like, you know, you're, you're the daughter of the most high God, and this is what you've accomplished. And these are the things that you're doing and God is making a way. And you just, you have to speak to yourself. So some of these accomplishments are markers where God gets all the glory, but it also is to say, you know, um, Aisha, I've chosen you for this. Aisha, you are forerunning. Aisha, you wow. are doing, um, you are doing my work in this land. And so keep going. And so, you know, it's, I'm, I'm very humbled and I'm very honored because to your point, Pastor Derek, I don't know that um, six, seven, eight years ago, you know, 2000, October 2012 is when I took History Makers, that this, I could have imagined that this would have been my life, my life up until that point. Wow. I'm just trying to get promoted in my corporate job and, you know, take my kids to the dentist every six months regularly, right? And maybe- yeah you know, buy a house again and have a nice vehicle and, you know, all of the blessings of the Lord um, and the successes of the Lord that look really cookie cutter and nice. But this is a tremendous blessing of the Lord on my life wow. to be able to do something like this, not just for my family, because I tell you, this work has been incredibly healing and restoring for my own family and putting my kids on a trajectory that is even greater than I could have imagined. But beyond that, that God would say, um, I can do, I have given you this, uh, this vision and this purpose and this ministry and this organization to do something like this for the nation of Canada, for families across the nation of Canada, to Amazing. share the footprint of Canada. And so I think that's important to acknowledge and recognize. Oh man, Aisha, we are so blessed by this. Let me tell you something. I, as, as many of you know, I made some announcements that we're, we're going to be putting our broadcasts on pause in this next season leading up into the new year for the sake of giving myself to some other projects, my new book that's coming out, all of that, uh, and article writing, some of this stuff. Um, and I'm just seeing, while Aisha's talking, I'm just seeing a whole new broadcast concept <laughs> beginning, I think, in the beginning of 2021, because we have to feature stories like this. You know, I'm connected with a lot of great people around the world, and sometimes we jump on because it's a big name that's being hosted on there. But look, these are the people God is using. What you're hearing here is the real deal. God is raising up ordinary people. You heard Aisha's story to do extraordinary work, you know, for the kingdom of God. That's what you're hearing today. So I know I'm watching the people that are coming on here and the comments that are being made. And you know what? Real recognizes real. And this is tangible stuff right here. <laughs> so Aisha, what would you say before we let you go? What would you say to people who have your story? who are emerging, they want to do something for God, they've been in church for a while, how to begin, where to start, what would you advise them to do? I would say, uh, well, obviously I would say just start, but beyond that, <laughs> yeah. just start doing what? Um, I would really say to begin to wherever you are. So if you if you have whatever your story is, but if particularly it's this, you know, start to do your research. I think that is a good, good place to start. So, you know, 
good work. What's happening in the community that you're in? What is the need that is in that particular community? What are the gaps? Like there's probably some programming that's happening. What are they missing? As Because you've been in the circumstances, you have a really um, lived experience insight into what the needs were for yourself and your family wow. connected to you. So, you know, one of the things that I have to really say, Pastor Derek, I've been, um, I, I when I was going into the prison, I remember proposing a program and the person who was coordinating that saying to me, um, what's your what's your background? Like, what's your designations and your degrees? I don't have degrees and designations. I mean, mm. I decided to go back to school to do some of that, but currently I don't have a university degree. And I'm putting that out there because I think that, you know, sometimes we have these limitations. Well, I need to have this kind of designation. I need to have this sort of education. I need to be connected in this way, that way. No, what you need to do is you need to know that you, because of your lived experience, because of the wisdom of God, because of the anointing and the authority that God has given you, that you can um, come up and create the solution based upon your research. So you begin with research and you start to go, what does this community need? What's missing? What are the gaps? And how can I respond? And mm. then begin to create what that looks like. When I started, I started with my research. Um, and then I started to reach out to people. So I literally started to figure out who was in the sector that I was getting into. And I would literally send emails and make phone calls. So on Wednesday, wow. I had... I had changed my work week because I was able to do that. So I was off on Wednesdays and my Wednesdays were spent doing research, reading articles and sending emails. I would, I had a sort of scripted template and I would say, you know, um, dear so-and-so, my name is Aisha Francis. I am looking to begin this organization because I think that there's a gap for families that are impacted by incarceration. Would you be open to having a meeting with me? And some people responded and said yes. And then I would set up coffees with them and I would sit and I would share the basis of what I was thinking. And people were so giving. They would give information. They would say, you know, this is what I do and this is what I can pro provide you with. Or I don't really do that, but I know someone. And so I started to get connected with people. And so there began, be began the genesis of Project Restore Phoebe. And then... Um, getting all this information together and literally taking out a notebook and starting to capture these and, you know, put things organized, organize my thoughts, organize the information, um, understand what were some of the unique things that were specific again to my community. So Canada versus like a lot of the data that I was getting from U S and then I started to organize that and spend time. Um, yes, some prayer, but all, some of it was just like, like you said, the wisdom of kind of organizing my thoughts and organizing and what would this program look like and starting to pull things together, doing some research on, you know, how do you deliver programs and then kind of writing my own programs and then starting to roll it out. So looking at some of the stuff that was happening in the sector, whether there were conferences, whether there were certain meetings, whether there were certain free trainings. As you say, Pastor Derek, you know, we start with what we have. So I had my phone, my computer, I had a pen, you know, these basic things. I didn't start with a bunch of funding or money behind me. Really putting myself into spaces to learn and develop, to develop and understand. Um, and then really starting to roll out what I thought was a really good um, project. In the background, I started to do the the work on um, establishing my organization. Uh, I think that's another thing that we often do in, in, in our Christian world is that we want to do a ministry, but we don't organize it. And so I was very intentional that this was not just going to be a ministry, but I was going to um, make it a not-for-profit organization. And, and then it became a charity. So I was in the background also doing all of the paperwork to submit so that we are a registered organization. So then when it came to rolling myself out there even though i didn't have credentials people would say oh um do you have a website i absolutely have a website you can go to this, this is my website oh are you a uh, registered i am registered oh okay because that was my credibility when i didn't have the you know three four twenty years of being an organization under my belt these things gave me credibility and opened doors to me where people would talk to me about donating money or 
providing funds or building partnerships because I was a actual organization. So that's some of the very practical things that I did. Um, social media is a very great tool. I started to post regularly. I opened up a Twitter account, an Instagram and a Facebook account. And we haven't, it hasn't been as great now, but in the beginning, I literally had a system where Saturdays I would go into a particular tool and I would post, I would do all of my tweets, everything for the entire week. And then they would just roll out automatically. And so, you know, and again, it was just little sound bites of what I believed. Families impacted by incarceration are important. I tweet and people would, you know, what have you. So it, but all of that was around building awareness of the organization, starting to establish a voice in the sector, starting to, I joined Facebook groups that were Facebook groups for families impacted by incarceration. And again, it was part of my research, but it was also part of engaging with that community, seeing what their concerns are, seeing, you know, those private groups, people talk about a lot of stuff. So really, these are some very practical ways that you can begin to do the work, engage with folks, and then start to touch people's lives. Aisha, I just love how you answered that last question, because if anybody was listening that paid attention, there was so much practical stuff there that absolutely needs to be done. I mean, what has been highlighted here is the other side of the coin. There's the spiritual part, but then research, research, research. Become the most excellent in your sphere, in your field. That's what we are hearing here today. I'm so blown away by this. Aisha, we really have to thank you for coming on here today and taking your time. I know how precious your time is and being able to, you know, voice all of this, to share this with us. We are so appreciative. And uh, what I want to do, your book, what about your book? You have a book. What's the title? Where can they find it? It is called. I, 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 I want to get up and get. Can I jump up and grab a coffee to show you? Yeah, that? do it. <laughs> do it. Ha! Ah, sowing seeds of change, developing leaders and their vision for the business of transforming nations. So I have a bit of a. I not a bit. I have a, a co-author there with me. Oh my goodness! <laughs> there. <Pastor she>, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. But, yeah, this is a phenomenal book that will help you to kind of uh, walk through what it is that God is calling you to do. And then the first half is really identifying what God is calling you to do. The second half are the practical steps to turn it into a business or initiative that will actually impact the community or the sector that you're called to. So awesome, Aisha. And that's available on Amazon. Look, we just want to thank you, you know, not just for what you've shared here today, but what you're doing for people, what you're doing for the world. This is the gospel of the kingdom. We want to thank you for being a history maker's representative, really. You've been an ambassador without knowing it. We've shared your story all over the world. You're a good friend. You're part of this ministry. We love you so much. And I think I speak for everybody. Uh, when I say that. So those of you that are watching, we're going to let Aisha go because as you can hear, and as you heard in her bio, she has a lot going on. So give greetings to your family from us, Aisha. We'll we'll catch up and just thank you so much for joining us today. And uh, for those of you who are interested in reaching out to Aisha, um, is there an email address? Maybe you'll put your email address in the comment section or something like that. Okay, I will uh, to do that yeah when it whenever you can just guys watch yeah. for it in the comment section she'll do that yeah. probably a little later so yeah. aisha bless you as you go we love, love you appreciate you. you i love you guys very much thank you bye pastor derek bye-bye well everybody you heard it right there i mean that is the real deal Th these are today's history makers these are today's reformers, those that are not even just bringing reformation, but total transformation of spheres of society. So we're just so grateful that Aisha joined us today. Again, her book, uh, Sowing the Seeds of Change, uh, all about the business of developing leaders for national transformation, for transformation in their particular sphere. That's available, amazon.com. Make sure you get it. I'm so pumped because you watch out, 2021, I have a clear vision now for it. We are going to make these broadcasts about people like that. 
And we'll have some big names on there too, of course, but people who are ordinary people who are bringing extraordinary transformation to their sphere of life. I'm so glad you've joined us today. I know this has blessed you. Look out for it on my YouTube channel, Derek Schneider Official, and you'll be able to listen to it again and again and take some of the steps that she had laid out, write them down. As you write it down, somehow you will begin to walk it out. We're so glad you joined us today. We love you. God bless you.